This must be an amazing book, because I looked at the lineup this morning, and I don't know who would get out of bed to come to church at 9 o'clock for this lineup. <laughs> this has got to be an amazing Bible. Good to see everybody this morning. Let's grab two places. I have two verses. I'm filling in for Brother Travis this morning, and so we're in Daniel chapter 2 and Isaiah chapter 40. Two verses on behold the opposition. Daniel 2, Isaiah 40. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 15, Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And then our other verse matching with that, Daniel chapter 2 verse 31, Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Now you know why really Brother Travis did not make it for the meeting. <laughs> so to find the Knox intent, <clears throat> we're looking at the great image of Nebuchadnezzar that we're that was to be beheld, along with the verse saying, Behold, that the nations are a drop as a drop of a bucket. In Daniel chapter 2, you understand that the wonderful explanation of this dream that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar outlining the kingdoms of the world. And beginning with Nebuchadnezzar, because God began allowing the Gentiles to take center stage on the rulership of this world. No longer was there a king in Israel, nor would there be, until all of these Gentile kingdoms are completed. And so the picture of this dream of this image is the great image of the Gentile kingdoms, that we are still in the bottom half of that image. Those Gentile kingdoms, as the Lord Jesus told us in Luke chapter 21, verse 24, he talked about Jerusalem being trodden under until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. We're still in those times. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, but when the fullness of the Gentiles become in, we're going to have a new, a new economy, and Israel again will take center stage. But as we go through each of these kingdoms on this image, and it's amazing, I think, that the Gentile kingdoms start with an image and they end with an image. They begin with Nebuchadnezzar's image here in Daniel chapter 2 as he says, Thou art that head of gold, he tells him uh, in this text. Nebuchadnezzar was the beginning of that and it will culminate at the end in those toes of that image. In Revelation chapter 13, the Bible lets us know that there will be another image that finishes that Gentile image kingdom expanse, and that's the image of the beast, and just as Nebuchadnezzar is going to even make an image in chapter 3 and have people bow down the same thing, you, you understand all of that history repeating itself with the Gentile nations. And this image, this great image, and we won't get too deeply into it, but it begins with gold and then it goes all the way down into the clay the mixture of the iron and the clay. And whether it's the Babylonian kingdom or the kingdom of Media, Media Persia or if it's the kingdom of Greece or if it's the kingdom of Rome or if it's the last uh, kingdom of the Antichrist and all of that combined image, 
All, all of that shows a degradation. I, I, Larkin wrote so aptly about how even the specific gravity or the density from the gold to the clay, it just continues to minimize. How you continually go down, not just in, in weight. This is a top-heavy image, which is going to let you know it's going to collapse. It's, it's, it's not stable. And as strong as the empires are of this world, they still are not stable. And no matter who comes on the scene or what kind of government it is or what leader it is or what party is in power or what nation seems to take uh, precedence on the stage of history, it all is going downward. It's, it, it's not getting better. And it won't get better. Because the image is going to collapse. The image is going to be destroyed. And so the value of this image from the gold to the clay, the density, the weight, all of that just shows you that things are going to constantly get worse as you are in this times of the Gentiles. And of course the New Testament told us that. It told, told us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that evil men will wax worse and worse. And if you think the world's going to get better, then I'm sorry, it's just not. It's just, just the way it is. And it doesn't matter. Again, it doesn't matter what the politics are. This image is going to continue the path that God said it was going to continue the path on. And the Bible lets us know that, that many of these kingdoms are, are very cruel. I, you know, it's so strange. I think that we as Christians, and I'm, I'm guilty myself, we look at our lives just in the context of which we live, and we don't look at the rest of church history and how people had to live. And so, so, so it's harder for me to live the Christian life in this generation because I really don't have a good perspective about how people live the Christian life under all these different kingdoms of the world that they had to live. And the truth is that we don't have it too bad. If you were living under the, the head of the gold, then maybe if you lived and you were taken into captivity and somebody made you live without your choice, well, what, what thing we take for granted? You get to live where you want to live. Not under the image of, uh, not, uh, not under the head of gold, you don't. You live where Babylon tells you to live. If you're going to live back in Israel with whatever governors there or, or whatever comes by and the insecurity of that situation without any uh, uh, protection, you may live there. Maybe you're hauled off to, to the Babylonian Empire, whatever your place is. Maybe he just killed you and you died or maybe he took you and made you a eunuch. T to live as one of God's people under that part of the empire be a very difficult thing. You're at totally the mercy. They're, they're, justice? <laughs> Fairness? <laughs> no. And God is still God. And his people that are faithful to him still prosper and they still accomplish great things. But I'm just saying living under that part of that image is pretty difficult. We saw Haman when I was preaching yesterday about Haman and under that Medo-Persia area and, and that, that's a pretty, pretty harsh time to live under. Can you imagine if, of course, the people of God then, a little different economy with the people of God now, but can you imagine if there was a, a decree of genocide on all Christians? How would that be to live under? And you had to stay and fight for your life, or, or you, and you have to bow. That, that'd be a hard kingdom to live under. When you keep moving through that image, then you go down into the Roman Empire, and the Bible even tells us in Daniel chapter 2 how, how cruel that empire will be. And, and that iron, he talks about how, how that, uh, that harshness, that bruising empire of Rome, it will, it will bruise, he said in verse number 40, that fourth kingdom. See, look at Daniel 2.39, look at that. After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. So, so the, the kingdoms just get more inferior as they go along. 
and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over the earth. Verse number 40, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. That's Rome. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces, that's pretty cruel, that's pretty violent, it's pretty hurtful, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. What a bruising kingdom. I can't imagine as the people of God having to live under the Roman Empire and having their, their Bibles burned and their people burned and going into coliseums and letting lions eat them. <laughs> this is what our brethren live through. This, this is what God's people live through. And I'm sure you would look at those empires. Wow, Babylon, what power. And it, it could spark fear. And it could uh, totally uh, just con uh, captivate every waking moment of what's Babylon going to do next? What's the king of Persia going to do next? What, what, is, the, what is Caesar going to do next? Uh, what, what, I don't know what's next. You pass on through that image and then can you imagine being under the Holy Roman Empire, there was nothing holy about it. Yeah. But having to live as a Christian then and having to either recant or be boiled in oil or thrown in the river with shackles with iron on you and watch your loved ones go through that, that'd be pretty rough. That's the times of the Gentiles. Yeah. Gentiles are just cruel there. Gentiles are, are full of violence and hate and they're heathen. And our brethren live through that. And what I'm trying to say is, if our brethren can live through all those kingdoms, I think we ought to be able to live through the kingdom that we find ourselves in. It should not overwhelm us. It should not overwhelm us. It's just part of the image. And our duty is the same, and our God is the same, and our mission is the same. It doesn't matter how the image changes. It doesn't matter how the kingdom changes. Can you imagine being born as a... As a, 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 into the Ottoman Empire. Can, can you imagine uh, having Muslims uh, cut your head off? Or your, th this is reality. We, we, I think we just live in a, a bubble sometimes. And, and oh, well, what about that British Empire? What a wonderful empire. John Bunyan didn't think so. <laughs> Well, if we get rid of the Catholics and we get rid of the Muslims, we'll just have a good, wonderful government. And that didn't help. The same, the same church that produced the King James Bible put a preacher in jail for 12 years because he wouldn't get a license from them and because he wouldn't agree with their doctrine. It doesn't really matter what the kingdom is. It doesn't matter who's in control. It's, it's all top-heavy. It's all... Uh, hurtful. It, it's all something contrary usually to the, to the will of God and the way God does things. And that's where we find ourselves in. Now we're living in a day of democracy and whether you go from um, a, a, an aristocracy or a dictatorship or or you go into the Roman Senate, or you move on down into, into socialism or communism or, or democracy or wherever you put it, it's all a part of this same image that is against God. Democracy, in, in our part of the kingdom, I, I don't know, probably... The depravity and the perversion that's come out of, democracy, of, of democracy could no more be rivaled than on any of the other heathen kingdoms. Democracy and freedom has been a wonderful platform for wickedness. It just has. And so we live in a different type of... of uh, we live in a different type of, of, of hardship. We're not under Nebuchadnezzar. We're not under uh, a Hasserus or, or, or a Haman. We're, we're not under a, a Caesar. We're not under a Pope. And, or, or we're not under any, any of these, any, any uh, uh, a Muslim. Uh, we're not under any, any kind of thing like that. But we are in a part of the kingdom that is so destructive to our lives in other ways. Never has a six-year-old 
boy or girl that was born in a Christian home be able to take a device in the privacy of their room and pull up what they can pull up now? Anything. The most twisted, perverted, dirty, wicked, defiling. I mean, that's what our children, that's what kingdom we live in. That's what environment we live in. So we just have, and we're, our souls are being vexed by all of this Sodom and Gomorrah and this kingdom that we live in. And, and if we're not careful, though, this is what we'll do. We go, go to Revelation chapter 17. This is what we'll do. And, and I, I'm not going to be very long at all. In Revelation chapter 17, and you can get Isaiah, you're in Isaiah 40, but all of these things are demonic. It's all devilish. It doesn't matter which kingdom it is. That's why God tells us that we're a peculiar people and, and uh, we, we are a holy nation in ourselves. And we're not a part of this environment. We have to live in it, but, but this is what will happen if we're not careful. And I see this because in Daniel 2 is that Babylonian beginning. In Revelation 17, and as the Gentile kingdoms end, you have again a discussion of Babylon. And Babylon's going to fall, and that image is going to fall, and those governments are going to fall. And, and when it describes that in Revelation chapter 17, he says in verse 2, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, heavens earth have made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And he, so he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit among scarlet colored beasts full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads, ten horns. All, all this it, it fits in with Daniel. Verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abomination, filthiness of her fornication. Verse 5, there are very few verses where you have so many words capitalized. This is a big deal. This culmination of, of the, this kingdom of the Antichrist and this Gentile rulership. Verse 5, and upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. She's always been drunken with the blood of the saints. Everything about that image in every government, every form, has always been contrary to the saints. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now, now watch this now. Watch your verse. Watch the Bible. And when I saw her, I what? I what? I wondered. Look at the rest of it. With great what? Is that not a sort of a strange phrase to you? John is captivated by what he's seeing with this mystery, Babylon the Great, this mother of harlots, abominations of the earth. He's captivated by it. He's consumed in his mind. He's overwhelmed. He marvels. Look at the next verse. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? What's the big deal, John? Why are you so overwhelmed? Why are you so captivated? Why are you so consumed? Why are you wondering? Why do you have such great admiration for this? Why does this look so big to you? Now, now look at Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse number 15. My message is really simple. It's really quick to the point. Verse 15. Behold... You know all that image? All, all that power, all that glory, all that gold, all that silver. Behold, the nations. That's Babylon, that's Greece. That's England, that's the Ottoman Empire, that's China. Behold the nations. Look, look, look at all of them. Look at the United States. Yeah. Just, just look at all. Take all the nations and just look at them just for a minute. Behold them. I want you to look at them. Now you, you beheld the image. And you're captivated by the government. And you're captivated by the power. And how, how they sometimes intermingle themselves in your life and affect your life. You beheld the image. But this is what I want you to behold. Behold the nations 
are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the aisles as a very little thing. This is what the Bible says. You think that image is big. You think Babylon is powerful. You you are overwhelmed with the nation and the structure that you're living in and how it's affecting your life. You you think that is so grand or so wondrous and it captivates your mind and it overwhelms your heart. If you just stop just a minute, if that captivates you, how much should a God captivate you that that image is like a piece of dust? And that nation, if I had a bucket here this morning, that nation is like a drop. God, what do you think about Babylon? Got a big bucket and a little drop. You know, if you have a drop in a bucket, you don't have much. You can't even water your flowers with that. You can't get a good drink out of that. Just a, you know, in the grand scheme of things, and I know how I was raised, and I appreciate the country I live in, but you know what we are? The Bible says those nations, they're reputed as nothing. To God, just nothing. So, who's going to win the house? Who's going to take the Senate? Wonder who will be the president. Wonder if the black helicopters are coming. Wonder if I need to prepare and get me a bunker. Oh, Putin, he all I do is push the button. China. Oh. They're watching us on TikTok. <laughs> and they're killing us with a virus. All of them, just a drop. You know what's sad? We are more consumed with what is going on in the kingdoms than we are with our God. We are more worried about what's happening in the kingdoms than we are what's happening in heaven. We are more affected in our heart by the drop than the one who holds the bucket. We are more concerned, how is this going to affect my 401k and how is this going to affect my life and what's going to happen? You know, I was thinking, I was thinking yesterday, you know how the world could change so dramatically this fast, and everything that you've ever known is over. I mean, a lot worse than COVID. <laughs> and of course, we all pray as good Christians, rapture is going to take place for all that bad stuff. I don't know. God didn't say, I won't let them drop nuclear bombs until you leave. He didn't say that. Well, what will we do? You know what I think? I think that all of us, I don't think we're very impressed with God. What impresses us is that whore. What makes us marvel and wonder with great admiration is what's going on with that whore. It's the image or the kingdom in which I find myself living in. If they're this powerful, what should I think about God? You know, you know why we're stressed? People stressed out. You know why they're stressed out? Because we magnify what God tells us to view in a small way. That great image in comparison to a great God is nothing. 
What's going on in my life in comparison to God is nothing. You know what he says? He says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. You, you know, if I'd have the proper perspective about my life, I wouldn't be so overwhelmed by the afflictions of my life. I would look, them, look at them as a small thing in comparison to a great God. But I have a hard time doing that, don't I? My afflictions and my problems look so much bigger than God, though they are not. It's so easy for me to be entrapped. That's why the Bible tells us to, to think on these things. Because we'll be thinking on things and make them so big. And, and our, our lives will be, will be overwhelmed in our lives. And overtaken with all these thoughts of life. When all these things are so small in comparison to the big picture and to the greatness of God. It's just a drop. The Bible tells us to uh, set our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Yes, sir. The Bible tells me that my life, just a vapor, appears for a little time, vanishes away. If I'm living in the Babylonian kingdom, if I'm living in the Russian kingdom, if I'm living in the kingdom of North Korea, if I'm living wherever I'm at, and no matter how hard it gets, if I'll have the proper perspective of God and see how big he is and see really how small everything I'm going through, and it doesn't look small to me. That's why the Bible tells us to magnify God. We're to magnify him. You can't make him bigger, but he, he sure don't look big enough in our hearts and our minds. But our problems look big, and our life looks big, and our circumstances look big. And he says, it's just, a, it's just a little time. You know what I've learned? You can get through anything if it's short enough. I just recently had gallbladder surgery, and I was determined to put it off because I have things to do. You know, you can't let something like surgery get in the way of doing what you need to do. <laughs> And the doctor said, well, you're going to have to have surgery regardless. I said, well, I don't have any gallstones. You did all those tests. I'll just eat right, you know, take all the remedies everybody tells me to take, and I'll be good. I'll lose weight. That worked for a little while. Then it quit working. <laughs> and so I learned if I didn't eat, that I wouldn't hurt. I, knew what, I, got, I, said, I said, Lord, I have got a, I got a missions conference I got to go here to preach. I got a mission trip to take. I got to preach Sunday. I, I, can't, I can't do this right now. And that pain, I'm telling you, I thought I was having a heart attack. <laughs> and it just kept getting worse and worse. It'd go away and get worse and worse. And finally, I had one last meeting. I said, oh, all right, God, I'll, I'll have surgery on Monday. Just get me through this last meeting and Sunday. And I prayed and prayed and prayed. And God helped me, but things started getting real bad. On Saturday, I just stopped eating altogether. No, nothing. And from Saturday to Monday, I made it. And I got through church Monday or Sunday. I don't know how I did it, but I got through church Sunday. But by Sunday night, I'm telling you what, I was hurting so bad that all those narcotics I was popping <laughs> wasn't helping. I'm talking hard stuff. I had my boy take me to the emergency room at midnight. I said, I can't take this anymore. I'm having surgery at 6. I said, no, I need it now. If you don't give it now, give me something. They, you know, okay. You can go back, sit back there for a few hours. We'll try to get to you. I'm, I'm going crazy. I can't take this. I'm telling you, when I can't take it, I'm, I can't take it. Guys, you can get in so much pain. I'm telling you, I understand why some things happen with some people's lives. I could not take it anymore. God had mercy on me. He eased it off. I went to the surgery. But what I want to say is, in the time that I was in a fetal position trying to hang from a from a bar, trying to get, trying to walk. I couldn't, I couldn't, it didn't matter what I did. I was trying to get rid of the pain. And every, I couldn't think, 
I wasn't quoting scripture. I couldn't think of a Bible verse. I wasn't worried about what was going on at the church. I didn't care about who I had to counsel next week. I didn't care about anybody's mission. All I, I am, I am at the end of my rope. I was crying, oh God, where are you? Help me. Give me some relief or let me die. I'm serious. I don't take pain well. But as soon as Monday morning came, it was all gone. And that which totally controlled every thought I had was removed that fast. No more pain, no more thought about it. And I was thinking, God, if I can just get to 6 o'clock, just get me to 6 o'clock, please. And it kept ticking and ticking. If I can just make it to 6 o'clock. And I walked in there early. <laughs> please, let me in. <laughs> she started asking me COVID questions, and I was not a very spiritual person. I said, I got to, if you can just get me to 6 o'clock, and it's over. It's like that dear lady going through that childbirth, and it's, but it's not going to last forever. And that's gone. And it doesn't matter where we find ourselves in our lives with our problems. It doesn't matter what kingdom we find ourselves in. Guys. It's only for a little time. And God says, I'll get you through it. I'll get you through it. Because what you need to see is that I'm a lot bigger than the biggest thing that's on your heart. And the biggest thing that's on your heart is just a drop. Lord, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for a good perspective of life. Help us to live that way. In Jesus' name, amen.